I um, would like to introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Ross Williams. This is the, the joy of conferences is that you make new contacts. Uh, I'm sure I'm going no, to uh, meet yeah. more Ross and speak with, uh, speak with him. I happen to have done an Omega project last year uh, all over Singapore recording sounds, raw sound data for a 2015 audio time capsule and another part of it is, is manipulated into created an, uh, an artwork. And so the two questions that Ross is asking here, I am really interested to hear some answers. What is the role of soundscape recording as cultural history? And what is the role of recreated or staged soundscapes? Nous écoutons ou bien nous... Fini. Merci beaucoup. Scott? Not Scott, Ross. <laughs> so, beg your pardon. <laughs> the floor is yours. We are going to hear some sounds. Yes. Great. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon. It's okay. It's not supposed to be anything there yet. Do you want to see something? I can put something. No. Um, if you'll indulge me, I thought I would start um, just with a little bit of sound, a little bit of music, actually. Uh, and it's not directly related to what I'm going to talk about next, but I thought it'd be nice to... It is and it isn't. Um, so this is some music, um, and it's was written to evoke a soundscape, so it's not exactly what I'll be talking about. I'm not going to play the whole thing. It's about seven minutes, and I imagine we're already almost out of time. So uh, I thought it'd be nice after all these images and talking that we relax, <laughs> digest our food, <laughs> try and keep awake. So here it is. This is of an, of an ocean.
goes on. Um, so I started with a figurative representation of a soundscape. That was a piece I wrote when I was very young, which was sadly longer ago than I wish. Um, and that's sort of peripheral to what I'm going to talk about today, only in so much as it talks a little bit about how I have come to where I am right now. Um, I'm a film composer. I'm a regular composer. Not that there's necessarily a difference between those two things. Um, and principally, also, I'm a sound designer. Um, and that's what I'm teaching at NTU. And I deal a lot with sound and image. And I deal with sound and image for exhibits and for museums and for film and for documentary and for animation and, and those sorts of things. Um, so I'm going to be talking about my talks. Actually, the title is The Urban Soundscape. I think originally it just said The Soundscape. I wanted to uh, distinguish that because I am actually going to be a little bit more specific. Um, the uh, thing to remember, of course, is uh, we live in a world that privileges image. And we live in a world that privileges voice and music over all other sounds. And it's the other sounds that I want to sort of talk more about today. And how do these sounds fit into the context, potentially, of cultural history? Um, and do they? Can they? How do they do? Um, these are sounds that I'm concerned with intimately when I'm sound designing, when I'm sound designing films or exhibits or things. It's these hidden sounds, the sounds that we don't remember or we don't think about but are in plain view for, to our ears. They're the ones that I, I end up being concerned with a lot because they are the ones that influence our experience of, of, of places and of spaces and of time. Um, and that's how, through my conversations with Andrea and I also I've talked with some other colleagues, Ken and, other, and others, about this sort of concept. Um, that's sort of what I hope to talk about today. I want to begin with a, a short quote, and this is actually from a, a website, uh, the Libsyn, Lib, Libsyn, no, what am I saying? Lisbon Sound Map, um, and it sort of sums up nicely something about what I want to talk about and the idea of sound as memory. And I ask all of you, um, how many of you remember what your, the street that you live on sounds like? One or two or three, good. How many of you remember what it sounded like 10 years ago if it's the same house? One, two, three, four. So this is something that's intrigued me because I grew up in Australia. I'm from Perth, and I lived in the same house for almost my whole life before I left. And every time I went back as I grew older, the sound of where I lived changed. I was living in a very semi-rural environment which became much more urban. And the sounds that I heard, the animals I heard or didn't hear and those sorts of things struck me, and because I live in a world of sound, I, you know, I've been a musician for all my life, those things I've found very interesting. And it's through the, sort of those thoughts that are, are leading me to sort of discuss what I want to discuss. Let's talk a little bit about this concept of, of soundscape. Um, we, the term itself is largely uh, believed to be concerned by, uh, coined by R. R. Murray Schaefer, who is an uh, incredibly important person in the field of acoustic ecology, which developed in the 60s at Simon Fraser University in um, Vancouver. And a lot of the field that, um, that I'm sort of touching a little bit on was developed with him and others in, 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 um, in um, Vancouver and then ex expanded through Canada and around the world. Um, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to play you now a little montage of soundscapes of the urban soundscape type and see if you can imagine where they are, because one of the challenges we're going to hopefully address for a little while at least is soundscape recordings and how they relate to places and how they don't or do relate to places. And if they don't relate to places, what does that mean? Um, so anyway, have a quick, it's only a short excerpt.
that's all of them. Does anyone recognize? It's, it's certainly the court of it's in Istanbul. Very well done. That's the, uh, that last recording is taken outside the Blue Mosque. The first recording inside the Blue Mosque. And then we had other ones in between. There was a, a street in King's Cross in, in the UK, inside of the Danish uh, Parliament building. There's some Czech farmers at a market in Prague. Um, there was a recording of Fort Tryon Park, where I was living in New York City, another one from New York City. So these are all landscapes. They all, some of them contain elements that we would consider immediately we'd recognize having cultural value, yeah, the, the last one especially, but the harbor one with the spe specific harbor bell and things like that. So we have landscapes, we have recordings that we identify and we can place, and well done for you guys placing that, um, and we have others that we don't. And these are things we'll talk more about, um, hopefully a little bit as we go along. Um, but the idea of, of soundscapes recording, and especially of soundscape recordings in history, I find very interesting. The idea of longitudinal recordings, what do things sound like now, and how did they sound like before, and what do these differences tell us? Um, now, in terms of historical recordings, we don't have a lot of purely soundscape recordings. We have, uh, for various reasons, technical is a big one, of course. In the early days of recording, it was very difficult to record anything unless you were yelling straight into the thing and you, so it was a voice and, and loud things were recorded. Um, and also I think the value of them wasn't necessarily identified, but this is just a curious thing for it's very short. Uh, Edison, as you can see, was hired to study noise because that's the thing. When we think about the urban soundscape, we use the word noise a lot. We go, it's something that we don't really like, so why would we record it? And then Armory Schaefer and things realize, no, this is, this is not the way to think about it. Um, but anyway, look at, listen to this. It's just bizarre because it doesn't sound like anything, but I thought just for fun, you can have a listen to it. I'm not going to play the whole thing. Um, so that represents one of the very earliest recordings that we have in that. The picture is actually not that picture, by the way. But yeah, the, that it's hard to distinguish the sound of the cylinder disintegrating as, as they play it versus the actual thing. Um, so as a historical artifact, it's very interesting as something that we can practically use. Well, we'll see. So when we're looking at historical uh, recordings, we have, like I said, relatively small amount compared to music and compared to spoken word. Way back, Bella Bartok was recording Balkan music right not very long after you could record sound. And the human voice was recorded one of the very first things. So we have reasonably good long history of recordings of those things. But the sounds that I'm talking about weren't privileged enough to be recorded generally. But where we do find them, which is interesting, um, is we start to find these soundscapes hidden behind films and radio plays and things like that. So medium that I've been in, which is film and things like that, I'm constantly using those kinds of recordings to put behind things and to create atmospheres and whatever, and the artists of those days did before. So if we're looking historically, we can find potentially these recordings if we want to do some sort of comparative analysis. I'm not advocating that necessarily a valuable thing to do. Um, and we also find them potentially caught in the background of even recordings of, of the kinds of, that you've done, you know, where we've had linguistic recordings, but in the background between the words and things, we can hear the larger space. Uh, and that's the important thing to remember, because uh, I'm always telling my students, of course, is the sound tells you what you can't see as much as what you can see. And, and what you're not aware of is what is so intangible and so interesting for me, at least for today, about these things. And if we talk about intangible cultural heritage, there's nothing more intangible than sound, and there's nothing more intangible than unscripted sound like we find in these soundscape recordings. And for myself, and I'm sure as you, for you as a composer, these chance events that occur within these things become very fertile for us to use create, creativity-wise. And if we think about the theme of this conference in terms of historical um, cultural history and creativity, the idea of using cultural artifacts or cultural objects in creating them into works of art, into film, into whatever, is something that 
that I participate in sort of every day and hadn't thought that much about until we sort of think about this. Um, now, I want to move into the next thing about this idea of uh, staged historical um, soundscapes. So I have here a picture, are you guys familiar with that boat key in Singapore from, I'm not sure when actually, but I have, I created a, a staged soundscape. So this is a staged sound for this city. Do you buy it? Yeah? No? No? no. Dissenter over here. What was wrong with it? Yeah. I mean, the image itself and the sound itself were obviously completely unrelated except for the fact that I told you that I had staged it for this. Yeah. The sounds themselves came from all over the place. There was a recording I made in New York. There was another one I made somewhere else. There was uh, some uh, sounds I got from a, a library that I would participate in. So I, but I've created a stage sound, um, which apparently not for everybody was authentic particularly. Um, but with, hopefully we'll feed into that, into our conversation about the value of these stage sounds and, and how, they, how they work. And here's another one, um, and this, uh, speaking uh, of Scott's talk about Civil War and reenactment, the idea of... Um, so this sound I didn't make. This is actually from a library, but it is a, a stage sound. And I just purely put the image up there for reference. How about that one? Yeah. So when we're contemplating stage historical soundscapes, obviously they have a, 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 a valuable place in various different contexts. And naturally, obviously, we're talking about soundscapes created to imitate historical soundscapes. Um, sometimes actual historical recordings are used as part of those. But as I said before, we don't have a lot of those recordings. And usually they don't sound very good. So we don't necessarily use them that much. But in terms of period film, sound design for games, uh, exhibits, of course, museum exhibits, things like that. They form a very important part of creating an immersive, immersive experience in those things. But what value do they have beyond that? That's something I'm not going to answer right now. Um, but we also are dealing with the idea of this Hollywood version of soundscapes. So we, none of us were born or alive 400 years ago. So what we hear, what we understand those soundscapes to sound like, a lot of times has been informed by films we've seen, period films we've seen in those times. And sometimes those period films are researched accurately and they go back to literature because we do have a lot of descriptions of sounds in, in literature. Um, and we find authentic objects and record them and those kinds of things. We make soundscapes that plausibly uh, could reflect the time. Other times, depending on the context, we have no interest in making them sound realistic at all. I mean, Disney is a perfect example of that. The amount of times I hear kookaburras in jungle scenes, kookaburras are strain animals, of course, I hear them all around the world in Disney films, which is bizarre. Um, but it makes um, us for an interesting argument because beyond that, once we create a soundscape, it becomes a cultural object on its own. So we now have a history of soundscapes, of stage soundscapes that become become very interesting. I'll just sound, sound it's everywhere. It's everywhere we are. Um, so again, I'm sort of going through quickly because I know you guys, have, I'm the last uh, person up. And uh, well, I was funny, I was joking with uh, Professor Sorensen. It's like, it's always the sound guy always is the last person to the party. 
We always get the last one. Um, so when we're talking about sound and image right now, and this is sort of with these stage soundscapes, they're for presentation, usually in a company of, of visual elements, although not always. There are exhibits sometimes that are predominantly sound-based. Um, can an audience identify where and when a soundscape is captured without an associated image? And some of you did when I played you those recordings. You someone said, that sounds like the Blue Mosque. Uh, a lot of us couldn't. And, and, and there's no reason why you should be able to necessarily because they don't have what we call sound marks. Sound marks are like landmarks. They're sounds that identify a location. And in the case of that call to prayer, though that guy probably sounds like a lot of other ones, it was certainly uh, a, uh, I wouldn't say a guess, but a good idea. Um, and then the other question is, how does our interpretation of a soundscape change with the context of the image? And that's where we lead into this conversation about uh, a sound revealing things that aren't visible. And when, I'm, when you're uh, looking at a soundscape purely visually, you're not necessarily hearing the cicadas or imagining the cicadas. You're not necessarily thinking or hearing the traffic over there. You're not necessarily aware of the, of the gurgling of the drain or, or any of these things. Um, so these are all things that I find interesting to contemplate. And I don't have answers to a lot of the questions that are, are coming up as we go. But I'm going to hopefully come back to them all in the sense uh, by the time we end. So to that note uh, about sound and image, I wanted to play just the two things I played you before, the Blue Mosque ones, this time inside and outside, and see if it has any effect on the way you interpret the sound now that you see the image. And now this is not, uh, to be fair, image that was captured at the same time as the sound. Okay, so it's sort of cheating a little bit. You, you could say it's cheating a lot, but... <laughs> I think the first part is more instructive than the second part. The second part, they're not facing the mosque, they're facing the other way, and you see people that are obviously not moving, so that makes it difficult. And the first part, hopefully you realize that with the visual information, then the spatial information encoded in the sound becomes more realized. So we suddenly, within that space, we now, all right, so that's the spatial information. And speaking of that kind of information, when we're looking at um, heritage sites and things like that, the the acoustic information, so the acoustic signature of those places is an important thing that, that that's an area called archaeoacoustics, um, where the idea of we've got to capture the acoustic environment so we understand how sounds sounded in those spaces. We, cap we capture what's called an impulse response, so we can capture what it would sound like if a sound occurred in this building. And they do that especially before restorations and things. And um, if we're going to restore a building internally, what are we doing to those acoustics? How is your experience of sound in those spaces changing because of that? And that's another sort of part of cultural history and, and not exactly concerned with what I was talking about. Going back to now to this concept of, of sound mark, I'll play a very quick uh, street scene. Um, <laughs> So we know it's a city, we know it's daytime, we know it's not raining, we know quite a lot of things about it if we really listen to it, but we don't know where it is. Um, so in terms of comparative analysis, cultural value, 
we'll see. So the idea of the sound mark, of course, and this is the same thing, and I've inserted a sound mark into it. So I've essentially staged a sound mark within an existing recording. And in this case, potentially, hopefully, to identify where it is. So you're all familiar with that. London, yeah, Big Ben. Now obviously Big Ben sound travels along a, a wide radius, so it could be anywhere within a very wide range of that, but we've now placed it. So this idea of sort of sound marking um, and how that relates to soundscapes as being cultural heritage, and again, it depends on what we're trying to use those sounds for. But. So I'm gonna pose some questions which we'll get back to later, but you know, is, does an urban soundscape is it representative of cultural heritage? And I, I would argue yes, and I think most people, certainly depending on the context. Um, and it certainly fits within the guidelines of the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage, although it sort of straddles a lot of bits of those um, things. Obviously, the recording itself becomes historical artifact, part of our, our, our cultural heritage. And then when that gets joined into other things, into films and whatever, we, we turn them into um, aspects of cultural objects. And then there's the whole field of acoustic ecology, as I was talking about, comparativeness, how, have our, how is our society reflected in the sounds of their environments, how have those sounds changed, um, and those kinds of things. The, um, as probably you knew, guys knew, the 27th of October last year was World Day for Audiovisual Heritage, UNESCO. You guys know? No, I, actually, I didn't know either. I found out when I was researching. Um, so. The next thing I want to get into, which is really the, the nuts and bolts, is we don't have very many heritage recordings of soundscapes. We have some, and we stage them, and they have their use. But what we do have right now is an explosion of new soundscape recordings made by people like you or people like that, because we all have access to things like this. We have access to recorders that can make tremendously wonderful sounding recordings very quickly and with limited instruction. I mean, you wouldn't record with an iPhone, but something this big can make a very, very good sounding recording. So we have an explosion of recordings, like we have an explosion of images from snapshots. So the comparisons, a lot of what I'll say, you'll be able to say yes, that also applies to image. Um, but I want to talk specifically about soundscapes because people have been taking images forever. Not on the volume that we have, but not forever, of course, but for a long time. But we haven't been recording like we are now. In the last sort of five to six years, um, the amount of recordings has gone up dramatically and our access to those recordings has been transformed. And as Nicole was saying with her website, her websites, of course, and the archives and so on, um, we can access them easily. So I want to talk just a little bit about accessing soundscape recordings and how those they're presented. Um, so we have, obviously, the archives uh, the Library of Congress, the British Library, and then the European Earth Sounds that you mentioned, and there are many, many others. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, some of them will have access, online access, some not. I know the British Library has certain recordings that you can use online, but others you actually physically have to go to the building and somebody will shuffle off and get it for you and bring it to you, and so on. So the access to those recordings is potentially sort of limited, um, and they're not all digitized. The amount of sound recordings that exist versus the human's ability to digitize them is pretty stunning. And one of the great advantages of new recordings, of course, is they're already digitized. They're all digital from the very beginning. Um, so I wanted to show you one uh, way of accessing this. Um, this is a, a website called uh, Radio Apore, or Apore, or something. It was started by a guy called Udo Knoll in 2006. He's an artist in Berlin and uh, Cologne. Um, and this is a crowdsourced uh, sound map. And sound maps are something I'm quite interested in. You'll see how it works in a second. I'm going to hit play, and it's going to do a little quick time. I didn't, like, I didn't want to try and negotiate the internet, so this is just a screen recording of me navigating it with sound, though. Um, and when you, uh, so this is the website. So I've, I've launched the website. Is that playing now? Yeah, it's going to take a second. So it automatically goes into the latest uploaded recording. Okay. And this is in Tenerife. I'll click on the metadata. 
I don't know if you can read the metadata, but this is recording to somewhere where you can read that. So that was recording. Um, interesting enough, this was where the shepherds would come down and wash their leather pouches in the ocean before they do some work on it and whatever. It's contained in the metadata. Purely by accident, this one came up when I was playing with it. So this is a place that has cultural significance, and this is a sound recording of that place, which I found quite fascinating. Um, the next one is of interest because this one is of Syria. And I was looking for soundscape recordings of Syria, Damascus especially, from prior to the, the conflict. So I have a sound mark recording. This is from 2008. But I'll pause it there, and there are other ones there. And this, these aren't all soundscapes, by the way. There's actually an interview with a journalist as part of this. And these are all uploaded by random people. And, uh, random, yeah, well, they're random. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of recordings over the entire world. And you click on that map, and you'll see Singapore has dozens and dozens of recordings. And you could potentially could upload yours to there, and they'd be mapped on there in the same way if you wanted to. Um, the, uh, but one thing I wanted to show you, which is cool, so I'm going to show it anyway, is this particular website, going back to artistic stuff, allows you to randomly take soundscapes and mix them together. So I've, whoops, gone one too far. So here is, is it playing here? So I'm typing in down the bottom, I was like, I'm going to, I want some sound of Australia where I'm from. No, what did I do first? Yeah, I did, I did Australia first. And because of the metadata, it actually gave me something in South America and uh, South Africa. And we'll talk about metadata in a second. So this is dawn in somewhere in South Africa, I don't remember. So the next thing I type in is Singapore. So now playing is South Africa and now Fort Canning Park in Singapore. Then I typed in Perth, where my home city is. And again, with the weird metadata, I, we're actually going to go to Germany and talk inside a hospital. That's a ventilator inside a hospital. It's not a soundscape, but anyway, it became a good composition. And then I tried searching Antarctica, but there, there's no sounds from there. So uh, the last one is Finland, and we'll get that in a second. And you can see you can mix the sounds. as a, a basic mixer. I can change the levels and things. And you can see the map has drawn now lines of the connections of of where I'm listening to in the world. I'm not sure where Finland is. All right. You don't need to hear the rest of it, but this particular website has a mobile version. You can put it on your cell phone and walk around and listen to these recordings anywhere in the world. So literally, you can be in any city and go, hmm. Has anyone recorded something weird here? And have a listen to it. For, I don't know what cultural heritage value that particular thing does. Um, just one other one I'll talk very quickly about is the, the Lib, uh, Lisbon sound map, purely because this one is an academically generated one. All right? And this is looking at the sounds of cultural heritage sites and how those sounds are changing. So this is actually taking, um, I won't go through the video, but when you click on one of these links, it pops up an image of where it was taken, when it was taken. And their idea of this website is to do it regularly at the same place every year to then trace how the sounds have changed in these heritage sites as the heritage sites are changing, traffic patterns change. You know, you just, all you're going to do is stop pedestrian traffic or car traffic through a, a make a pedestrian mall and you've changed the, the sonic environment dramatically. Um, a little bit about metadata. Uh, there are conventions, of course. It's essential for all sound metadata, I believe, to have comprehensive GPS coordinates. We've got to be able to go back to where things are recorded so we can re-record them. Um, sample rates and bit depths have to be high enough that the recording quality is good. And then 
we won't have time to get into this, but the idea of how do we name, what are the naming conventions when we're trying to use words to describe sounds? Because that's a stumbling block for a lot of us. And I know I've got one minute left, so the future, dun, 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 dun. Um, obviously, secure digital archives, one of the big fears of the future is all of this beautiful material online gets hacked like Sony did, and all of a sudden we lose some of it. So making sure we have redundant systems of this kind of data, because this kind of data isn't, most of it's not in, they're not in museums, they're not in institutions, they're out there in various public, private websites, and can we find a way to drag them all together and keep them safe? Another one, automatic, automatic metadata creation with machine learning and so on, hopefully we'll get to a stage where we can just run hundreds of hours of soundscape recordings or whatever they are, and the metadata gets added automatically because information is only as good as the information you can find. And when I'm searching for films, uh, for instance, I was doing a film about uh, Egypt and it was taking a documentary taking place in the time of the uprisings, and I had to find recordings of the riots and things as part of this documentary. And fortunately, with good metadata, I was able to get that quickly. And then the thing for me is interface design. How do we create interfaces for web-based access that is compelling and interesting? And the sound map's one potential solution, but I wonder if maybe there are better solutions than that. So I don't think I answered any questions that I posed, but hopefully that's... Thank but you, I Ross. got it down very fast. I mean, we are all on the way to <laughs> not necessarily finding answers, <laughs> but asking questions.